Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of the Midnight Charrette, a design variety show by two architects, myself, David Lee, and Marina Borderone. This week, it's just the two of us. Oh, just no. Two of us, and we are talking about design competitions, architecture and design competitions. We've received a number of messages, people asking, should I do it? How do I find competitions? What are some strategies to be successful in it? What will I gain out of it? We answer all those questions, and we do so by basically talking about our experiences, um, you know, working through different competitions. And that's that, right? Yes. We cover all those things. That's, yeah. that's pretty much everything you could possibly think of. We also discuss why it's not a good idea to do competitions and what it's like to do ones as students, as professionals, and everything else. If you have any more questions that we did not cover, you have questions by the end of the recording, then shoot us a message or voicemail at 213-222-6950. That is our own hotline. If you call it, it goes straight to voicemail, and then we play the voicemail on the show and have a discussion about your message. You can also text the number, and we will do the same thing if you text. Yep. Right. We are supported by NAAD. Nod. That is the name of the company, N A A D M E dot com. That is their website. They are who? They are an online uh, store mm. that sources goods uh, from North Africa and the Middle East mostly, trying to promote the creative work of uh, younger emerging designers. Mm -hmm. A design very, store. They are a design store. They are definitely a design store, not just like a you know like a normal random online store. They're like extremely well curated. Uh, they have collection coming out like you know pretty often with the seasons. And their things are very unique. They're really affordable and absolutely amazing quality. Um, a lot of the stuff I've never seen before anywhere else. So I feel like get on it before it becomes too popular mm -hmm. and you can't afford it anymore. Um, and if there is something that you like, uh, you, do, you just use the code MIDNIGHT when you check out and you get 15% off. Go on nadme, n a a d m e dot com. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And they ship worldwide. So oh, no limits. Yeah. And we have ARCHICAD, a program developed by Graphisoft, a Nemechek company. ARCHICAD is a BIM program. Listen to episode 169 with Bradley Corey, where we discuss ARCHICAD, its powers, uh, its powers, its mysterical, mysterical? Mister mystical. mystical powers. It's mystical powers. <laughs> uh, it's mystical powers. Uh, yeah, it's a program that we like. That's why we support them and we talk about them. Um, it's fast. It's light. It is robust. It's good for small and large offices, small and large projects. It's good with teamwork. It's good for remote working. Go to graphisoft.com. Try the trial. Listen to 169. We'll recover it more in depth. Also, check out Study Architecture. Study Architecture is a website where students can find information on architecture programs to help them choose an undergraduate or graduate program that fits their needs. There's a list of over 100 summer architecture programs for students who are interested in developing their design skills over the summer. And Study Architecture is produced by the AC. CSA, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture. This is the Midnight Charrette with myself, Marina. Here we go. Competitions have come up a number of times in the podcast, kind of in the periphery uh, with guests and when we took in, it's just the two of us. Um, so we decided to do a recording about them. Let's see how it goes. I think we're going to cover kind of uh, what the process is like and perhaps why, why doing a competition is a good idea. We're going to primarily talk about... Um, uh, um, non-built uh, project competitions, right? Because that's um, what we have experience with. Because that's what we have experience with, yeah. And there there are for sure uh, competitions for buildings, for museums, for large structures that are where the winner is actually awarded a contract to be the architect. We're not going to talk about that because our experience is not really in that realm. Um, we do have experience in, in built competitions, let's say, that are at a much smaller scale of like installation, right? Um, have we done have I done any that were not temporary? I think they were all temporary structures of some kind, uh, which we can just categorize as installation, right? Yes. All right. So I suppose the first question is, why would you do a competition, right? Yeah, why would you do a competition? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Interesting interviewing tactic right there. Too. Well, I mean, you've done a bunch, right? Mm -hmm. So when did you do the competition you, you did? Yeah, so the f the very first one that I had done was I, it was during school. I was an undergraduate uh, school. Um, 
And so for me, what happened was I had gone through four years. I was at a five-year program. I'd gone through four years of school. And at the end of that fourth year, I did not feel like I was prepared to tackle thesis. And looking back, I think I was correct. And looking back, I was also a little bit probably overthinking the situation. Um, Sounds like you like every day. But it, because <laughs> the first, those four, four years went by super fast. And suddenly I was like, wait, I only have one more year that I'm supposed to be graduating. And I, I don't feel prepared. I'm just so, getting nostalgic on, on leaving the bird's nest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I took a, a year off between fourth and fifth year saying to myself, uh, I'm going to use this year to focus on the mu some music because I was in a number of uh, bands. And I'm going to raise my GPA because my GPA was suffering a bit. So was that a considered like a sabbatical? Um, it's not. I don't know if you'd call it a sabbatical because I wasn't getting paid. But basically, I was still a student, still full-time student. But I just didn't take studio uh, that year. Instead, I finished um, other courses. That way, I could have less courses to take during fifth year. And I finished courses to get a minor. Um, so, so you made a deal with the university, basically. There's, there's no deal. You don't have to tell anyone. You just don't register for studio and you register for other classes. But you still have to pay a tuition. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so for me, there was a number of reasons why I did that. And uh, certainly the, the lack of confidence in my own design thinking was part of it. Huh. And I think I also felt that way because every studio was pretty structured, as they typically are. And I wanted to know... I never really got the sense that I was able to just try something on my own and not have to adhere to the the uh, the motives of the studio or the teacher. You know what I mean? And you felt like maybe after you graduate, once you start working, you would not have that chance either. So you kind of had to do it between I the don't, two? I don't. Yeah, I suppose if I thought about it, I would have agreed with that statement. I don't think I even thought that far ahead. Oh, it was mm -hmm. just like, I have one year left and the, the thesis year is not... Uh, multiple quarters or semesters, um, different studios rather. It's just one big studio. So the idea that I had only have one project left to try and sort out some of these internal thoughts didn't make sense. But you could have just like, like done random projects on your own. The fact that you chose to do a competition in a way is like doing studio, except that instead of having a teacher for a whole year, you have one project. You mean I could have done... It's not like you came up with the program of of the pro like the buildings you designed or whatever, because it was a competition with a given program with a given subject. How is that really different from the studio? It's entirely different. I cannot I cannot explain or, or or state strong enough how different that is from studio, because in studio, yes, there's a program, um, and yes, in competitions there's a program. But that's about the only overlap there is, right? You don't have an instructor telling you that these are the deadlines. You have no one telling you um, these are the milestones you have to hit. You have no peers to speak with about the same thing. There's no um, community culture that helps you be hopefully productive, right? The whole social aspect of the project is completely out the window if you're not working with others. Um, and in addition, again, most of the studios, the teachers have their own specific agenda with mm -hmm. that studio. And and it's a, and it's probably more of a trend now than let's say 30 years ago because all the teachers they are they are themselves building up their portfolio and they have to work out ideas through the students. So as a result, the students um their projects have to fit within a certain uh framework that the teacher defines. You know, like this quarter the, like the program is a museum, right? But really we're going to investigate facades through th this program. Um, and that was pretty common, something like that. So as a student, it's like you never really get to just be on the open road and just see what you can do because everything's authored, pre-authored in a way, which has its pros and cons. So, but for me, as a result of that and, uh, my, my, you know, uh, what my, uh, Your personality, personality, my adolescence, my childhood, uh, childish nature. I never feel like I was ready by the time I got to uh, end of fourth year. So anyway, I took that year off and I did a couple, uh, a number of competitions f for those reasons. But you still went to school to do it. You didn't like stay in your apartment. No, no. I, I, uh, what happened was I made an agreement with a studio professor, um, who had a class and this, the studios at Cal Poly are cold studios, which means that, 
uh, for that quarter, you have your permanent desk and you're in that room the entire quarter. You don't share it with anyone. Um, so I made a deal with one of the professors that I would basically just occupy a desk in his studio, but not be part of his class because he had not a lot of students in his class and he had the space. Uh, I say deal. He didn't get anything in exchange. I just asked. I him mean, I remember me. seeing you around. You had three <laughs> ridiculous desks with okay, whiteboard so, so, so. <laughs> hanging from the ceiling so. and like handmade like like glue bottle holder with like sand in it or whatever fuck. And I was like. Uh, I was like, who is that guy who comes in at night so, so when sexy. everyone leaves? Like, he starts his day. And I'm like, but what is he doing? He's not following studio. It's, you know, one of those, like, school hermit, like, weirdo who lives in the building when, uh, you know, everything shuts down. Yeah, I was like uh, the like hunchback of Notre like Dame. A, yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> What's his Quasimodo? Uh, it's, it's the night I can come out and work now. It, was, it, it felt like that. It really felt like that. Uh, it was like that, and it, um, n also probably not in a good way or healthy way because I was really unorganized. Um, but, but so, but, but, so, so, but, so, but wait, but you, so you chose to make the deal with that teacher, and and you did that because you felt like you had to have a dedicated space. Oh or, yeah, almost yeah, like yeah. okay, I have to like have an office that I go to, and when I leave, like I'm done, and it, this is not in my bedroom, in my apartment, in my dorm. Like, I have to have a special space for it so I can put the right mindset. When uh, I need it? Um, yes, definitely. Uh, yeah, of course. Of course, of course. I could not work at home. I had too much crap, uh, first of all. Um, so... So how many did you do this that year? Uh, three. I did two on it that were completely on my own. Um, one of them was um, kind of a permanent installation scale. I don't remember the square foot. Maybe like 50 by 80 is like the site um, along a, a heavily populated a boardwalk and uh it was installation uh based that kind of, that kind of uh, project but it was permanent meant to be permanent and it was a it was a real competition actually the winner was awarded a contract uh to have the thing built um the other one was a chapel um also i think that was a, a uh how do you just i used to call it a real competition a real project in the sense that it was for an actual client who needed a chapel and they wanted to see Know, what they would get um and then the last one was i guess you would call it an, an ideas competition in that it wasn't going to ever be built but um it was still meant to be within the realm of reality yeah. like there are there are definitely very conceptual competitions like the evolo oh, tower competition is a great example most people know where you can have floating towers that are you know levitating by anti-gravity paint there's that kind of realm and on the other extreme end you have something that is for sure, going to get built, and you need to deal with the program in a responsible way. Let's say, like a museum. So the the ones I did were always kind of within that spectrum, and I like that zone because it's it's um, it's uh, it's loose enough to where I could work out much more conceptual ideas, but real enough so that I've I myself felt grounded in what I was doing because I that's the era that I needed to work on. I didn't feel like I needed to work on highly conceptual parts of my thinking or process i feel like i need to figure out how to translate conceptual things to things that could be built maybe it's not practical because of budget right maybe the total square footage for the bathrooms is not quite uh, accurate but it for sure could be built and it could be tweaked to to be constructed so that's kind of how you your process of selection to which competition you were going to participate yeah so there's a you had an, you had your own agenda on the things you basically wanted to improve on Yes. So whether or not you're in school or out of school, that's the primary reason for in doing a competition, I think, is to try and work out some own things that you have. Now, you could say, why don't you just do that completely on your own, make up your own program and not even have to adhere to a competition or pay an entry fee or whatever. I don't think anyone in the world uh, is ever that uh, structured uh, with their life. It, it just, you, think, you need that pressure. I think it's like, you know like working out like you commit to a gym sort of right i mean you commit to a gym or you commit to a trainer well you're gonna have to do it sort of but even it's even less realistic if you do it on your own because it's a, it's a completely fic fictional thing so there's the whole game 
for students and for practicing architects, the game of, of the, the established program that you're given and how much you push back against it. Right. Mm -hmm. And some things they cannot change. Like you need a certain number of uh, rooms, right? Okay. That, that has fixed. I need a hotel that has this many rooms, but there's always, you know, more or less pushing and wiggling to inject new program or to remove stuff. And so in other words, you need to have a sense of like there's established given material and then you're relating to that in some way by manipulating it to a certain degree. And I don't think you can create all of that on your own. So, um, but anyway, so yeah, selecting the competitions was based on, on the, the areas that I needed to work on in terms of like the, how conceptual or realistic and also basically competitions that I felt, uh, were manageable, uh, as an individual, right. An installation that occupies a 60 by 100 square foot space. Like I can, I can figure that out. I can do drawings. I can do renderings. I can do diagrams and whatever. If I were to, again, as a, as a, I guess, four and a half year student, if I were to try and do a complicated museum that's going to get built, probably a little bit out of my comfort yeah, zone. Yeah. And also I'm a full-time student still, right? So going back uh, before even you selected the competition, how, so that was the first time you were doing a competition. Um, how did the idea came up? Like, how did you hear about competition? Hmm. Like, I think if, if for me as a student, I wasn't aware that competition were even existing until like pretty far, pretty far in my, in my degree. Um, and, and where did you look to find those competition and register and apply for it? That's a good question. And actually, um, one of the teachers at Cal Poly who I kind of looked up to, um, he had said, if you're going to take this year off and you have these questions that you're bringing up, you should do competitions. Um, he said, and I, I've actually been involved in many competitions kind of throughout my life up to that point, but not for design. I did a lot of like martial arts competitions, music competitions. So I was used to it. And I kind of knew the value of going through that process, mm -hmm. what it's like to be competing up against people you don't know, what it's like to lose, to win, to hit the deadline, to perform. So the value that he was telling me would bring it, I kind of bought into um, how I found the competition at that time, there was a website called death by architecture.com. Um, and death by architecture is still around. Actually, they kind of shut down for a bit of time. I was just going to say they shut down. Yeah. I think, yeah. Okay. They that did. was just for like temporary. It seemed like it. Um, okay. but I checked on their website the other day and it looks like they're back up at full force and they list as far as I can tell, every single competition you could find online is on that website and you go in there and you click, you know, by submission date, by cost or by registration date. And I would just go on there and choose ones, um, that I thought were manageable. I also chose ones. <clears throat> you can also, I think, search by student competition, <coughs> yeah. professional yeah. or both, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I also chose ones where the program brief uh, you know, met my needs, let's call them. And also where the jury or the client, uh, I call it the jury, uh, was somewhat in line with what I was looking for. And it's kind of weird because you've probably heard everyone listening to that, like you don't do a competition to win, right? That's not, in some ways, that's not why you do it. You do it to learn and to grow, right? I wonder actually how many of the people who do a competition really think about a competition that way. Well, I think it's totally true, and you, you do have to think about it that way. But I do also think at the same time you do it to win. Yeah, it's both actually, because there you need that that drive, that urge to win, to be committed. At least most people do, I think. And also, the reality is you don't want to spend a lot of effort on something knowing that there's no chance you're going to win, uh, because what happens is, I think you're going to end up kind of fooling yourself. So if you enter a competition and it's a really uh, practical, realistic thing, and you're doing some crazy high high concept uh, proposal, if someone asks you objectively, you know, what are your chances you're going to win? You'd say zero, because that's not what it's about. However, in the process of the project, there's a part of you that thinks, ah, but maybe they're going to be so amazed by my design, <laughs> because I, I think it's so amazing that they're going to say like, you know what? We need to make a special first place award for this person because it's a really good design. Do you feel? And that's not that's not a that's not accurate, right? So, so in other words, I'm just saying that you do want to give your the, the yourself the chance 
to win because that's part of the fun and that's part of the the reward but do you feel like if you're telling yourself like oh yeah i'm doing it to win and that that's your ultimate goal that somehow it's actually going to be detrimental to your proposal um because you're trying too hard the way i look at that that's a good question the way i look at that is if i find that i have to uh, um that that the design let's say if i find that my design and my process is different because i have to adhere to certain things that are part of winning mm -hmm. then the way i look at it is not that it's holding me back but it's just forcing me to deal with a new problem the same with like, any other design right your site is a triangle well that's fucking annoying or trapezoid as it always is in school that's annoying but that's instead of looking at it and saying well that's a limitation because i want to do a, a circular plan you say okay i have to wrestle with this trapezoid what does that do so I think that's a much better way to approach design in general, and also if you come at it from an educational perspective, right? It's just a new challenge I have to deal with. Um, but again, it's about pushing up against that structure, right? And if you know that there are X, Y, and Z that have to, have, I have to conform to to win, then it's up to you to decide how much do I push against that. And competitions, actually, uh, uh, they have their set brief, and they say you must have only one board, and that board has to have, you know, again, X, Y, and Z drawings at this scale and stuff like that. You cannot submit anything else. And uh, you have to adhere to those rules to only to a certain degree, because there's a lot of people that win competitions that, quote unquote, cheat, and they don't follow the rules. In fact, Maya Lin, this is a great story, right? Maya Lin won the, oh, uh, fuck, what, what memorial? Vietnam Memorial? whatever memorial in washington dc right the competition program outlined certain things she completely ignored that and did her own proposal and she won had she followed the brief she would have not won because her entire design like ignored a significant part now for the people who followed the rules that's really upsetting because they had let's say quote unquote limited themselves or manipulated or or crafted their design to follow the rules she didn't and yet she's being rewarded and there's a lot of stories like that. People who don't follow the rules win. So there's you, you kind of need to somehow get a sense of 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 those boundaries. Um, well, yeah. at the end of the day, I mean, you know, if the person who wins his the the, the best project, the best proposal, it is. I mean, I can get that it isn't fair because like you play by the rules, and at the same time the goal is to get the best project so like you said if you know like how much to push back with the the limitation and the constraint that are given to you like you're being smart about which ones you're pushing well you know if the project is the best it's the best you yeah. know what i mean like you're what you're not gonna take the second best because the second best play by the rules but it's actually really not to the level as the other one like that's being a little i don't know detrimental to like you know the actual design and, and the goal of that competition in a way. Yeah, totally. And I think practicing architects have a better sense of this um, game that we're talking about because, again, they're used to dealing with a real program attached to real money with a real client, and they have to push back and tell them, you need to change this, right? Students, it's a little more difficult, but you should use your common sense. Uh, the other thing you can do is just reach out to the competition jury and the hosts and that, that organization. There's always an organization that you can uh, email or contact with questions, and it's a very good idea to do that um, in a professional way and not overload them because you don't want to get potentially blacklisted yeah, yeah so you so you pick the first competition and then so you find out on death by architecture i think like arc daily also has a category about competition i'm sure i think bustler is another website that has some bustler yeah. um and it's probably like more than that so you signed up for the first one you're like okay this description suits me the timeline seems reasonable i have interest in the jury so you kind of do like some uh like background check and research mm. about I'm assuming like the jury or the price or the timeline, like t before you sign, before you sign on, right? To a certain degree, yeah. So I, that's why I said um, oh, you just did like okay, just fuck it. I'm just gonna sign. Well, on. there's a little bit, a little bit of that too, for sure. Um, so you need to find a program brief that makes sense for you, and also the jury, right? And that's also how you can tell how much you can push against the rules and how conceptual they're going to be. If it's a jury full of academic architects, that tells you one thing. If they're all from one institution, that tells you information as well. Um, 
And of course, like a you know student, you don't want to pay a hundred bucks to enter something. So there's all of that math, which is pretty straightforward. Um, the actual registering, I never allowed myself to overthink it. I would just kind of hit register, and then I'd have to deal with the consequences of now being signed up. Now, it's peculiar because, again, I could register, and especially if it's a if it's a free competition, which a lot of the student ones are. There's still nothing you know, forcing me to do this. There's no pressure. I don't have a studio. It's, I'm not going to be effective if I don't do it. The, 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 the organization is not going to care if David Lee of in California, <laughs> they've never heard of, doesn't enter, right? But somehow, psychologically, the act of entering, it makes it much more real. And I knew that I needed that to actually do it. So it was right? like a commitment to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You commit before thinking and now, no. you ha now you're forced to do it. Um, so that's how... That was my approach because a lot of students ask me actually about competitions and should they do it? Answer is yes, for whatever reasons. Um, and they talk about finding them and they're not sure if it's quite right. And if you don't see any competitions that work at all, then that's one issue. That's one kind of scenario. But at any given time, there's probably one or two out there that are close enough to what you need. And my advice always is just fucking sign up. You don't like people overthink you things. Know, you know, I think about competition like I think about tattoos. Oh, <laughs> right? Like just, <laughs> just, just, just do one, just get one. Yeah. And then, you know, you think of it a little bit more for the second one and the third one. And, and, and the last one you do will probably be your best, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But then, but the tattoos are permanent, and you're stuck with the first one, which is uh, the worst. You can tattoo over, you can remove, uh, you can, you know, in those ways. Um, but that's interesting. I think that's interesting. It's almost like you kind of have to jump, and then and then look back. Yeah, and um, I my other advice is to start simple because you don't want to undertake something that's too big again, and that kind of ruins the competition realm for you. Um, start simple, and then work your way bigger. That's why I said I think I started with an installation, then a chapel. And then the third one I did that year was a tower, but it's a it was a team competition, and that was part of the competition is to work with other people. So, wait. Yeah. So before we dive into the working with other people, like, so how did the first one worked out for you? Because you're on your own, mm -hmm. you have to manage like time schedule, you know, like basically running the whole show by yourself. And I, I don't. Did you have any teacher advising you on those projects? Um. No, not for those two. It was just, yeah, no, it was just not, you. not for yeah, just my on my own. And uh, you learn through those two and all of the competitions I've done outside of school or, or the office. You learn very quickly your own limitations and the problems you have. <laughs> I'm serious, like, and that's also that's probably one of the greatest um, aspects uh, uh, of doing a competition is you learn a lot about how fucked up you are so what were your problems <laughs> <laughs> a lot there's a lot of problems and a lot of them i already knew but then to feel it it's like uh it becomes really real because again we've talked about this right when you work on your own you have your own business that's different from working at an office and when you work at an office you can't push a lot of problems onto the office i wouldn't have this problem if the office was run correctly i wouldn't have this problem if they gave me more pay time off or whatever the same thing happens in school and any time you're part of a structured organization or structured life you push your problems off onto that structure a lot of times subconsciously um but when you do a competition there's no one there if you fuck up there's no one to blame you miss the deadline you don't do the drawings you your design isn't there's no one to blame it's just you um so for me the problems were a total lack of organization um i think the design process that i my design process was not clear which i knew um so that wasn't a revelation um i i think th that was those were probably the biggest ones uh, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't look too good. No, <laughs> when you start with that, you kind of. <laughs> well, I mean, those struggle. are like pretty much the entire thing, right? <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> it's like, wow! If you're not organized, and your process doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. what are your chances to win? <laughs> the one thing I I feel like I was pretty good at, though. No, I wouldn't say I was pretty good at, but but I I could handle, um, decently well as you know a fourth year ish was knowing what documents i needed to produce to show what i was trying to communicate were the documents were the graphics good a lot of times at, the, at these competitions no they were pretty poorly done because i waited too long at the last minute um were they always the exact right document in the right scale no for sure not but g going through the exercise of thinking i have this proposal how do i express it that was something i had kind of 
done before my own. And I think that's actually another really important thing that students in particular uh, would gain from competitions because studios more and more now are more structured to where it's like you have to pin up exactly what I say because everyone else is pinning up exactly that. And as the teacher, it's important that we see everything be formatted exactly the same. Your sections are all going to be the same exact scale, all of this line weight only in these three colors and pinned up this exact spot, this exact height, right? And it will be cut on this exact piece of paper. And it, it, I'm not exaggerating. This is common to a lot of schools. That sounds crazy to me. The problem is like when you do four years of that or five years of that, that means the students actually never seriously questioned, does this make sense for my idea that I'm trying to communicate, right? Well, they can't make their own decision. Can't make like their own the, decision. The smallest things. Exactly. And it is all about how you represent your ideas to convince other people and to convince yourself. So that's a, uh, I mean, that is, that's fucking gold to have to go through that process. Um, and that's something else that I really liked about the competitions. Uh, but in terms of the problems, yeah, a lot of problems. Wait, so you knew you had those problems, but did you, so did you try to improve them throughout the process of doing the competition? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I tried to, but the, the lack of organization is an ongoing process <laughs> for me <laughs> <laughs> to this day. And I, I and, confirm. <laughs> and I've, I've, looking back, I figured out ways to do it. Um, there's no secret, really, to solving... Excuse me. Um, there's no secret, really, to solving uh, um, being unorganized. You just have to get more organized. You have to make lists. You have to set deadlines. And actually, the... Um, uh, the the third competition I did was with another person, and that's when I realized, like, oh, I can actually solve some of my problems by just teaming up with the right people who are <laughs> complementary to me, um, you know, for sure. So the the, four, the first two I did, I didn't win. the The insulation thing, mine was too. Uh, I think it could be built, but the chances of it working as I wanted it to, very, 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 very low. It was actually an interesting uh, thing. So, like, uh, it, it was by the beach off, uh, on the uh, adjacent to a boardwalk, right? And I had this idea for um, these these tall uh, tubes that were in a grid, and they would be suspended, and they would kind of like sway with the wind, which is like mimicking the swaying of the the grass at the beach. Wasn't it a memorial? It was a memorial, yeah. It was actually a memorial, a Holocaust memorial, which is I feel like every architect needs to do one in their life because because and. Um, it was an interactive um, installation so that it would be there and kind of sway as a sculpture. Um, and the tubes were like super long and they created a perfect floating cube in that sense. Um, and the, the aspect was that people could come up and actually grab the tubes and swirl them around and they'd be tuned to uh, not make a, a song, but uh, a tone, right? So if one person is swirling it, you'd get kind of a whisper effect, like you'd hear it faintly. But perhaps in the chaos of the boardwalk and all the people, it's not enough. But if you had everyone doing it, they would create this harmony and be like very loud. And it had to do with, you know, one person standing up versus a, pe a group of people standing up and whatever. But again, the physics of, of tuning things and everyone doing it and how it's suspended, that I didn't work any of that out. So, um, but nevertheless, I, I look back and I, and I like that. I, I like that idea. Yeah, I think I did too. So... Did you, like, I'm always wondering, you know, like, if you do a competition, and like you said, you didn't pay any money because it was free, it's on your own, no one's checking on you, and you have all of those personal struggles you're going with during the process, like, have you thought about giving up on the first one and be like, you know what, there's no, I don't have to finish, why do I just stop mm -hmm. now and make my life easier? Um, that's the one thing I don't have in me, yeah. And if any, anyone goes and signs up for a competition and starts and they stop and because they don't want to finish it, I can't help them. <laughs> you know, I, I think, I think that's either in you or, or it's not perhaps. Um, but no, that was, that was not an option and, and, and not so much because, well, I think there's a competitive nature, but it's once you fall in love with the design that you're creating and you're invested in it, you don't really give a fuck about anything else. Right. And so, um, that that's where I was going to finish no matter what. It's also very dangerous because that means if you miss the deadline, you're still enamored with your design and you think you can still work on it and have it be productive, which doesn't really happen. So then you submit it. You submit it on time, hopefully, right? Yeah, Set barely. up a bunch of alarms. Barely. <laughs> and it sounds stupid, but having to submit um, something by an exact minute, by midnight on this time in this time zone, uh, you learn very, very quickly that you just have to 
And that's where I have no sympathy, no, um, I guess sympathy is, would be the word. I have no uh, uh, feelings toward people who show up late or they aren't able to submit, submit something on time. Because I know, having gone through that and more serious things in life, if you took this deadline, if it was a serious matter to you and you knew you had to do it, you would for sure 100% fucking do it. You would set five alarms. You'd be, you'd have all your stuff done, the PDF made, whatever it is that we're talking about, a day in advance, and you'd submit it well before 11, 59, 59 seconds. You just would, you would do it. Um, so I don't believe in this, like, I couldn't get it done. I, I couldn't happen. Yes, you could have if you took it. If your life depended on it, if yeah. your life actually depended on it, you would do it. You just don't right? take it seriously. So it's just a matter of, of degrees. Yeah. Um, so I think I hit, I submitted everything in time, but. Uh, <laughs> and then what? And then you're like, you're stuck with like the weight. And like every day you're like, am I going to win? Am I not going to win? Or you just forget about it and like sign up and to sign on on the next one. You just kind of forget about it. You know, life, life goes on. And then when you realize that you didn't win, it's like a huge bummer because again, regardless of how outrageous your proposal is, you think in your mind, like there's, there's a chance. And this gets, I think maybe to the, the third competition, which is probably the most important one. Oh, well, the, one of the most important ones I'd ever done for me as a, as a designer, the faculty member at my school who, who was sort of a mentor in a way, uh, one of the things that he said was you should do a competition to work out all the things you're talking about. That's great. But really you should do it to win and if you do win it'll completely change how you feel about yourself it'll completely change your life right because my life is designed is, is defined by design and architecture it'll yeah. change your life and it was at that time and i said yeah i mean i've won i've done a lot of competitions i've won some like i know what it means to win not architecture competitions. not architecture competitions so i said that and he's like okay <laughs> you know like okay <laughs> you arrogant little shit like <laughs> enter and see so the third competition that I had done, again, was with a friend. It was a team uh, process, a tower, and um, we paired up. I can talk about that process, but in the end, we won. We won the first place, and we were fortunate enough um, to win five of the six subcategories. Like, we cleaned out oh, wow. the thing. We were, it was a good project, but also we were lucky, you know. And the professor that told me they would change things. He was, I, I could not believe how right he was. It changed everything for myself and my teammate. And um, we had other people helping us, but they weren't like partners on the project. So for the two of us, it, I think it, 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 it 180, everything was different. Like the world was, it looked different to us afterwards. Um, there's a little bit of like excess of arrogance as a result, but, but I'm not talking about that. Like it actually changed. It, it was, it is validation. And you think they give you a boost of confidence in your, I don't know, design self or something. Yeah, a boost of confidence. But even it was more than confidence on like a superficial level, which is how I think confidence is thought of in terms of designers, because designers are very arrogant. And prior to winning the competition, I had very strong feelings about what I thought was right and wrong in design and how things should be and whatnot. And you would think with that high level of you know 19 year old confidence that you don't need any validation because i know what i know and fuck everyone else um but when you receive validation from a whole bunch of people you've never met before and, and except they only know your project they don't know you uh yeah it's it changes your your feeling about yourself and a in a core at a core level a completely internal legitimate real sincere feeling it's different. But it's interesting you say that about the fact that you won. I wonder if, you know, people who did not win that competition felt the same way in the opposite direction. Um, no. I think what happens is, well, hey, well maybe. It, de it depends. I mean, there's some people there who oh, I think they, were, they actually threw all their stuff in the trash afterwards. <laughs> um, so maybe not for them. I think for a lot of people who are more dedicated, they don't think... They just keep looking for that validation in some form. And there's different levels of validation, right? There's your peers liking what you do. Who cares about them? Your teacher liking what you do. Okay, that's kind of nice. But an international competition where you're getting validated by a bunch of different architects <clears throat> and a bunch of jury members from around the, the United States, 
uh, that's a different thing. It's a totally different thing because they, they, that competition had nothing to do with my school, right? The school knew what we were doing because we had an advisor who – he actually didn't do anything. He just signed a piece of paper and said, I'm the advisor, and he wasn't involved because he, he knew that we wanted to do our own thing. Um, so to get validation from the outside world, outside of your own institution, which so far has been your home base – yeah, uh, amazing. Totally different. And that's another one of the big three reasons I would say to do a competition is for that. So so you you started like this taking that you're off like for like your, your own personal choices and you did two competition on your own. And then for the third one, you decided to partner with someone. Mm. How I mean, that's like pretty far from like your original mm. goal, mm -hmm. you know, like how did you decide to team up and how did you select that person? Yeah. Um, well, the project, I liked the project and I don't remember who found it. I don't know if it was him or me, but the, the program was good. We liked it. It was a housing tower and there was a lot of things there to, to kind of like feast on in terms of design. And uh, it, it couldn't do it on my own um, because uh, not so much. I couldn't do it on my own because it was part of the competition to work with other students in a team. Got it. Right. How we decided to do it together. I have to ask him because I don't remember. <laughs> he, he's the one I knew from school from like three years before we had one studio together and w we never talked to each other outside of, out, after that studio. Did we you never work together before? We never worked together. I didn't, I didn't talk to him for two years because uh, risky, he yeah. was a year off uh, after that and whatever. Uh, I have to, I have no idea. It was like, let's just do it. And so we're like, okay, let's do it. It, it makes no sense actually <laughs> thinking about it because it could have done like gone, gone horribly. Um, so then we started working together. And, and it went well. And again, I realized he was like, okay, let's make a schedule. And I'm like, what do you mean make a schedule? What are you, a loser? We don't need a schedule. He's like, no, you idiot. <laughs> we need to make a schedule. And he opened up Excel and had colors. I'm like, wow, this is like an intense, you know, schedule. <laughs> You're like, good. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the process in that one was interesting. Um, it wasn't anything... I think the 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 part that was looking back on it, the part that was important as a as a takeaway was that um, to win a competition because people generally want to know how to win. It's all about the idea, right? There's some things you have to have done, right? If you don't break the the uh, the cardinal rules, that's one thing. If you submit on time, that's another. Um, you know, if uh, what's another thing? You know, paying your fees and stuff like that. But outside of that, like it is all about the idea. And it's really fascinating to think that for all competitions, uh, actual built projects or installations or anything like that, the winner is actually decided within the first two weeks of the process, assuming the competition is six months away or three months away, let's say, right? The first two weeks, the winner has been determined because the you, you mean you mean if if you were able to be the jury and have kind of like a bird's eye view of all of the people applying to the competition at stage two weeks you would already be able to spot who the winner would be in the whole crowd. Well, uh, sort of. What I mean to say is that when you get to the, the final uh, pinup, if you all get to be in one space and you look at the 12 finalists and you look at the person who won, the person who comes in second place, they, regar regardless of how well executed their project is, they were never going to win because their idea was not the first place idea, is what I'm saying. Okay. So... There's a certain level of execution you need to achieve right to win. I acknowledge that, but that aside, it's it's it doesn't matter. The two, the first two weeks are the most important in that sense. And you is know? that something that you've observed um, as as you did competition? Yeah. You notice that it's always really the best idea that wins. Well, the idea way? that the jury chooses, yeah, like. Well, I've we, we, I've entered plenty of competitions and seen other participants where it's it doesn't matter. You could have spent another three weeks on this polishing, getting all the renderings right, and making a more convincing video story, whatever. Would have not mattered. You still have not gotten first place because your idea was not was not theirs. Your 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 blue tower, right? It might be the most sexy blue tower. It's not a red tower, and that is a really interesting lesson to learn. I think going through it. Um, um, that's not to say you can just come up with a great idea and then chill out the rest of the time because with competitions now and digital media, everything has to be super high level execution in terms of graphics, which is a little bit kind of a bummer 
kind of a bummer in a way. And I think um, it's also misleading how people uh, approach approach the competition, yeah. therefore, right? Because mm-hmm. they have a tendency of focusing very early on about the execution or like the type of images or renderings or like media that they want to use for it instead of tackling the like the key core idea of their proposal. Totally. And I think this also, for me, I've always been a believer in and you, you have to have a strong... A good project has a strong idea. Call it a concept, call it a, I don't know, whatever your thesis, call it whatever. It has to have that. And I was looking for validation because the the other students in my classes and things and other projects that I saw in real world that were, that were getting the real world, that were getting awards and getting, you know, all of the praise, they did not necessarily have a strong idea in my mind. And um, you could say that the jury, you know, it also depends on what they like. They're just going to choose the concept that they ag- agree with, and there's a certain amount of that. But I think if you, if the idea is robust enough, right, and it is coming from a very well-defined, again, also robust problem, it's very convincing then. So we had spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, rather, in that first part, Um one, because that was our interest, but also the competition itself was a two-phase competition. Right. The first phase, you submit um, a conceptual packet. Basically, it's your proposal. And there's diagrams, uh, basically all diagrams, some sketches maybe, and you had to submit a video of talking about the proposal. And depending on whether or not they liked it, you move on to phase two. And phase two is where you actually execute the thing, do all the final draw, and all, and, and all, all the final stuff. Um, and so it you know, it built within the competition was this kind of focus on concept. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if we, if we had done any other idea, we just wouldn't have, have one. So let's say, the, I, I don't know, how long was that whole competition uh, process? I don't remember. Like maybe three months, something like that. Right. Yeah. So let's say out of those three months, how much, if you can remember, how much time do you think you spent like just working on like concept ideas and maybe how much of that time did you allocate to actual final predictions of mm. documents? I don't remember how much time we spent for the first phase. It wasn't a whole lot, um, but it was intense. Um, the final production, <laughs> final production is we, we, we teamed up with a bunch of other students to help us produce. That was part, part of it again. And, uh, we kind of waited until the last minute. Um, so I'd say like all of the production happened within two weeks. And because we had like nine other students helping us, which was kind of too many, and they would kind of circulate in and out like kind of randomly, that therefore what they produced was not as usable as we'd often want. Don't get me wrong. Like this is, they're, they're all spending their free time. They, they, they had nothing to gain from this except for po- us, po- us possibly winning, Yeah. which you never know if you're going to win. Yeah. Like this, despite all my, my talking about having a strong concept and whatever, like you just never know if you're going to win. That's the way competitions work. Um, so yeah, a couple of weeks to do the whole thing. And a lot of it was just a lot of really, really late nights. And this is where you have to look for support from your school. So we were not, this is not through a studio. We had an advisor, yeah, but they weren't really involved. And um, you know, like we had to get access to, let's say, the computer lab for after hours, right? So there's a lot of things that we need to get desk space, which I already asked from the teacher. So this is a good thing, too, to kind of look for support in places you might not think mm-hmm. because um, whatever organization that you're a part of, a school or a business, like if they have their heads on straight, they're interested in you succeeding because, again, it's proving the school, it's validating the school, you, and then by extension, the school, the rest of the world that, hey. You're trying to bring value to X school, place. X business, yeah, yeah. you know. So that that was something else. Uh, then you won. <laughs> and then the ne- the year after that, you had to go back to studio. <laughs> Did you feel then that, you know, you kind of graduated in a way? <laughs> No, well, I don't know if I, I it's, or um, were you like, all right, I'm ready for like next level competition. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, that was the biggest competition. It took the longest time. And because we worked with a bunch of people and there's two of us working closely, like that was really our chance to talk about our ideas out loud. If you do a competition on your own to work on your own ideas, you can, but again, you get kind of lost in your own thoughts, having to vocalize it to someone else constantly and them to you. It was probably the first project where I could say I could look back and understand all the aspects of it conceptually and understand which parts were successful and which which were not and where we got hung up and we didn't. Like I have a very good understanding of that project. 
and understanding meaning how it relates to my feelings about design and what I got out of it, which is like a very important thing, which is not the same thing as like a, a, a understanding um, someone else's project, like why they did design moves and stuff like an internal relationship to the thing I created. I have a very strong understanding for the thing, what went right and what didn't go right, what I would change and not change. And that was again, in, invaluable, you know, did you feel like you could have like done that competition without having done two prior to that? Hmm. No, because uh, the the two before, even though they were unsuccessful, um, they allowed me to incrementally make steps in terms of my own thinking. So then when I was speaking to this other student and all these other people, I I could phrase things a little more clearly and I could understand where I was coming from. Um, and it... it 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 made the process less of a shit show, basically, because I had dealt with my my own internal deep and yeah, demons yeah, by yeah. then. Your issues. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So like so like let's say I don't know, you do like a team competition. Maybe before people do those types of competition, it would be good for them to do one on their own, so they could kind of test themselves out instead of testing themselves out with other people. <laughs> I know. I to I totally I totally agree with that. I think that's a good idea for that individual, and I think it that's that's. Uh, they're also doing like a public service in that way. Yeah. Like I think it's it's not a good idea to team up and not having done something and then put all of your problems with doing a fresh competition onto someone else. Like you can't do that. Um, that also is also to say that. So I'm a big advocate with teaming up with with colleagues because it makes it more fun. Also, um, they're going to help drive you and vice versa. But you have to make sure you're on the same page in terms of what you want to get out of it. So he and I, um, my friend for the the tower, we talked like, what do we want? I want to do something cool. I want to do a good design. I want to work on some thoughts and I want to fucking win. I'm like, hell yeah, I want to win too. I don't want to do some competition <laughs> not not win. And, and so... Well, you got to make sure you're on the same page. Like, yeah. It's like if you start a business with somebody, you don't want to half start the business. Like you're committed or you're not yeah. committed. And we need... And, and like people need to have the same level of commitment or at least yeah. be frank to the other person what their level of commitment is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Because when shit hits the fan, which it will, because it's a design project with a deadline, or some, there's going to be a late night somewhere and it's going to be stressful. The person that's having the the, the problems, right? Uh, no, the person that's not having the problems needs to know how to treat the one that's struggling. Right with harsh love or, or whatever else, and what their expectations are. So, in the process that we went through, <clears throat> you know, and it's, it's actually a pretty good story because it started for the two of us. Then we got to the second phase, right, which is a little bit of validation already. And then we had to team up with a bunch of other students. That was a challenge. It was a process. It's how do you convince other students to help you? They get recruited by you paying them with Taco Bell and coffee in the computer <laughs> lab, which we shouldn't have been eating in there, you know. And some of our closest friends today came from that process. And then to for the final uh, presentation, fly to a different state, you know, uh, nearly across the United States. Um, and there's a whole logistical thing there. You don't feel like a real adult. You have to get to the airport in time and bring your model. You have to pack the model, pack the boards. <laughs> you know, how do you pack a model? How do you can you bring boards on an airplane? Turns out you can. They have a special place for like coats and thin objects. And uh, we nearly missed the flight because we were hanging out in the airport, and we were like, we didn't. <laughs> So young, we didn't know that like there's a difference between boarding time and like takeoff time. So you we're like beginners. We're like, oh, we got like another 25 minutes, you know. Um, and then you know, get to the place, get in the taxi, all new things for someone it who's never so worked stressful. before. <laughs> Try to sleep the night before, and um, you know, we we show up, unpack the model. The model's crushed, <gasps> but we had brought glue with us, so we had to try and repair the model the night before. Why did you? Take the model as a carry-on in the plane? Yeah. You can do that? Yeah. Well, but, but now, it has to now. fit? It has to. No, it wasn't a very big model. Okay. But we also, there was a base that we kind of deconstructed that we knew we'd have to Got assemble. It. So when it went through the scanner, the the TSA were like, What is that? Is that a bomb? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a bomb. <laughs> Look out, man. It's the future of the world. <laughs> it's the future of housing. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, we get there the night before, and like we got there so late that n nothing was open, so we couldn't get food. <laughs> Had to repair the model. And the morning of, uh, my teammate woke up before I did and went out to get Starbucks to kind of get us in the routine. And it sounds stupid, right? You're like 21 years old, let's, let's go get Starbucks in the morning. But 100% necessary. Um, you know, put on your blazer and go go down to the thing, set up all of your all the books you've researched, all the materials. 
Then you do the presentation, and then you wait around uh, for the day, and then you oh, come so back. So you for the had awards. to do a, a, an oral presentation, yeah, an in-person presentation. Yeah, so you stand. It's like a wow, science fair. Wow, that's like a legit competition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't in front of. Uh, so just uh, you like send the PDF and no. then wait for a couple of weeks. No, um, wow. and but to actually, that's another interesting part too. Is that this one you got to give a presentation, right? Uh, which is more nerve-wracking, but also good because you can talk your way through things. A lot of competitions, you don't get that luxury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when teachers are always telling students, like, your board should stand up on their own. Like, you shouldn't have to present it. And as a student, you're like, yeah, well, I am presenting, so fuck off. But I'm telling you, well, again, the first time you have to go through, through that on your own to submit something that no one else has any idea what your ideas are, they're not going to know your name. They're yeah. not going to know what you look like, where you're coming from, what school you came from, yeah. why that school prefers, you know, uh, I was going to say ink on mylar. It doesn't happen. But um, prefers this aesthetic or that. None of that None of that matters. All of the safety and all the structure that your school has created for you to excel within, you excel within that system, within that game, right? None of that matters at all outside of your school. And when you realize that, you realize, one, how much bigger the world is, and two, um, it's just uh, you grow up. You grow up, right? The fact that so-and-so impressed that teacher and that teacher has this aesthetic and whatever, no one gives a fuck about that outside of that studio, outside of the school. They really, really don't. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, we had to give a presentation um, and then all the jury gets together and you wait around for six hours, oh, went and walked God. around the city to try and like not think about but, it, yeah. come back and they announce their awards and you know, we did, we did well. Wait, so when they announced that you won, were mm -hmm. you surprised? <laughs> I don't, or because you kind of have a, like a sense of who else came that day to present that your chances were. No, the other the other projects that people submitted were were um, I don't think conceptually they were as strong. That's of course that's my opinion, um, but they were well done. And and some of the other entrants they were not like we did this on our own. They were part of a studio. Got it. Um, which is to not say so they, they had they more had, more people involved. Um, no, they were still smaller teams, but like their teacher was there, okay. for example, okay. like that's, it's a big deal for them and that teacher to be there to potentially win. <laughs> and then they didn't. <laughs> uh, I, I think we were out in the middle of the day walking around the city waiting to go back for the awards. And of course we're both super competitive and interested in the project. So we're kind of, you know, talking to each other, like, you know, what do you, what do you think? Uh, but we both felt like, uh, we could see a scenario where we win. We could see a scenario where we didn't win. But we had put so much work into it and been through the roller coaster of the whole process that we were so happy with it. It was like, honestly, I don't care at this point. Like, this has just been a great journey. And we've made some great friends. So this is this is perfect, right? Um, actually, we the truth is we kind of got a bit plastered. <laughs> and then we got to the got to the awards. A little bit buzzed. A little bit buzzed, um, for sure. And then they, they announced the awards and we won. And it, it was a good time. It was fun. But the unfortunate thing was that uh, we went out in the city afterwards to celebrate, bought some cigars, never smoked a cigar, got horrendously sick. <laughs> what well, good thing you did after. <laughs> and then I had to be back in at my school at the city because I had a performance, a music performance, um, like that next night. So I slept for two hours in the hotel, boarded a flight, and got back to to the city. It was very yeah, the stress Your just continues. Your life before me sounds so stressful. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I brought peace into it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that's that's um, that's pretty cool. So what happens then? There's the internal reward of all of that, right? And now because it's a competition that we we both won, and we're both students of the school. The school knows about it, right? The school's happy about it, and I can't remember if it was for this competition or another one. I had also received like a scholarship to do things. I th was it this one? I don't remember. But you know, you have to pay to fly somewhere. How do you do that, right? You ask the school. You say, "Hey, we were finalists, or I, I'm going to be presenting this paper, or whatever." Oh, for the for the final presentation. Yeah, or for whatever process. Like we need money to do this. This and the school gave us gave us some money. Wow. Um, I mean, I mean, I think that's a good, like, you know, that's a life lesson too. Like, if you don't ask for things, mm. you're never gonna get it. No one's ever gonna offer it to you. Yeah. So you have to, you have to be resourceful and ask people. Yeah, 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 no, um, um, definitely. And when we, 
got there was some like award money with with the competition. It was like some really small amount of money, but we we're so excited. We, we, I don't know why, but we both went out and bought new white V neck t shirts. That was like the in <laughs> thing. It was like, hey, you got a new t shirt? Hell yeah, I got a new t shirt. <laughs> so uh, poor, splurging yourself. Yeah. <laughs> And um, the competition yeah. kind of lived on because we – this is another thing that you learn, I think, is that you don't just produce stuff and you let it kind of sit in, in within yourself or in your studio and you don't tell anyone. If you think it's worthwhile, you put it out there to see how other people respond. You mean so get it published? Get it published, and... right, in various places. Um, talk to the school and end up giving like, a presentation to uh, the school about the whole process and things like this. And – you know, I think maybe sometimes a, a lot of architecture designers feel like this peripheral stuff getting published or saying I want to give a presentation about it is a little bit self-centered or it's not central. It's not the work. But the amount that you learn from doing those things is so much. Like how else, when else am I going to get a chance to have to put together a formal hour, hour-long presentation to a giant group of people that are peers and people I look up to? It's very rare. So what and there is things that people could get out of those things, you know, that you could like share yeah. and, and, and or inspire at least people to do something like that. So I think it's worth it. Um So what uh, so if you had like I don't know, like five advice to tell someone that wants to do a competition and that want that's interested in winning the competition, is there like some secret ingredients that you could hmm. share with them? Yeah, I mean, just the ones we talked about. So you have to know the jury. You have to be dedicated. You have to have killer graphics. You have to submit all your stuff. You you can't have crappy looking material and you have to have a good idea. Um, and the more, again, robust, meaning the more the idea can, can have like tentacles and like have its tentacles engaging in a bunch of things, the better, you know? So it's not like a one trick pony. It's not a one sliver of an idea that's, that's good for half a second and that's it. Something that really can be understood quickly, but also be understood at a very in-depth level. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. And then that's it. And But none of that guarantees that you're going to win. You know, yeah. like, so after those, uh, I'd also done one or two on my own uh, or with you um, while working full-time somewhere. That's and, right. Oh my God, that's... I mean, I think, you know, like the ideal scenario of doing a competition is basically what you did, right? You take a year off, yeah. you have support from an institution, you have support from like your parents or whatever for like money. You don't have to like, you know, work to pay your rent and yeah. all that stuff and just focus on like, getting that stuff done and done it right. When you have a normal life, like you're working, you're working on projects, you're taking the subway, you have to like feed yourself, you know, clean yourself and all of that stuff. And you're trying to do that on the side, even if it's a teeny dinky competition for like, I don't know, that was a very small installation, right? It is so much work and struggle yeah. <laughs> to just make it fit within that schedule and also be able to turn on and off that switch when you need it. Uh, I mean, that was not easy. No, not easy as, at all, especially when you're, it's your first year living in uh, New York City. That was my first, oh, no, that wasn't my first competition, actually. That was my second competition. No. That was my third competition, actually. Really? I did, uh, well, I, I, no, that was my second. I did one, no, that was my third. I did one <laughs> my fifth year in France uh, while I was doing my thesis project. One of my thesis teacher was like, well, actually, you know, Paris has this like ongoing urban competition thing, and I think you're thesis project that you're working on right now and I like, could very well apply to, you know, their interests and whatever. So I submitted my stuff, but I didn't really do any extra work for the competition. I just kind of worked on my thesis and ended up like package, like, uh, you know, like packaging it and like submitting it yeah. for it, thinking like, well, maybe, you know, they could like what I have. I didn't really do the competition in that sense. Right, right. So, of course, it didn't work out because that's not what they were looking for. <laughs> but I was like, hey, here's my stuff, take a look, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. So that didn't really count. But I did have a, um, I did a competition actually when I was at Cal Poly during my exchange program. Part of the studio? Part, it was a studio, mm -hmm. which it is interesting because it's a different setting than doing it on your own as a student or doing it on your own as a professional. It was mm -hmm. actually like doing it with a class, with a teacher, as a, a part of your curriculum, right? Um, 
And it was a team project. And actually, I think what was very interesting, like you said, is that it's interesting to pair yourself with people who are complementary to you to work on the proposal of that competition. Right. So the team, I think we were like, I don't know, five or six people. And, um, you know, it was like three or four architects and two or three engineers. So it was very interesting because we were kind of bringing like the more like aesthetic, like concept, big idea, big gesture, you know, to the table. And those guys were bringing like, oh, structurally, how that's going to work to try and make it real in a way. Um, it's interesting, though, because uh, when you work with a larger team, it becomes much more comp. When we work with a, team, a larger team where everyone's equals, it becomes quickly much more complicated. And I think one of the <clears throat> things about who you work with and the size of the team also, there's a sense of um, not motivation, um, uh, like moving forward that happens. So when it's one other person, you can kind of make sure that you're each taking one step f forward. I don't, I don't mean progress in terms of like design or production, but just like the feeling of that you're, you're advancing, you're advancing, you're advancing. And sometimes I feel like when you have a committee, right, you kind of just you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and no one's actually trying to take a step forward emotionally. And I feel like that's exactly like that for like, or like, like professional projects. Like if you have one or two person working on it, those projects move like way faster than when you have a team of like 50 people on it. Yeah. Because it's like ping, ping pong, you know, the ball keeps like moving around, but really where is it going? Right, right, like, right. you know, or like who's giving it momentum? You don't really know after a while. So it was very interesting. And that made me think of the fact that, you know, most of us didn't do any competition before joining that studio. And I think really it almost should have been a requirement to join that studio would have been to like have done stuff like that before mm -hmm. because you're dealing with a huge team which you know brings the whole problem of being part of a group there is a leader there is people who are like more quiet and then you have like architects engineers they think and they talk differently so how do you make those like you know work well and and then the commitment you know some people join studio because they didn't like any of the other studios yeah. or like some people join studio because they do want to win the competition you know, so the level of commitment and, and the personalities and, and all of the logistics was actually a lot of stuff to deal with before even having to deal with the competition itself. Right, right. Um, so that was, that that studio actually was a very good experience more on like the social and like human skills right. than it was about doing a competition. Um but um, yeah, no, I mean, definitely not. A, um, we definitely did not win, <laughs> and, and uh, so we were different teams within that studio, and none of our teams of that school won that competition. Um, but it, it, it was, I think, it was pretty interesting to to be part of that. Yeah. And then we had one guy who went like, just crazy in the team and like just <laughs> took the model home and like worked on it like over the weekend and like what I do again like team man like you know it's it's a team like it's a collective effort we're all in it yeah there's always a little bit of like push and pull and uh, you know people would call it um, uh, oh, fuck what do they call it compromise right which I hate the word but that there's always a little bit of that but I think if you can have the, your, if your agendas are the same, that's the first thing you have to have on the same page. And if the big idea is also shared, then that's that's one thing too. I think you also realize when there's a hard deadline and you miss it, or you you submit final stuff that's way way undercooked because you just didn't stop the conceptual part process early enough. How much of a waste it is, yeah. you know? Because, like, in a structured setting. It's not, it's a waste, but it's not as much of a waste. One, because a bunch of people, it happens to them. So you're kind of like, you don't feel as bad. And two, because you still get rewarded you still get a grade. You still get praise from your boss. You still gets used in some way, right? It's like, it's produced something. But when you do a competition on your own and you submit some 50% executed thing, th 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 that goes toward nothing, you know? Um, it's a really, it's a missed opportunity. Uh so that so professionally we had we had uh, done a couple um I'd done one or two part as parts of an office uh different offices and uh one where we worked with about some other people and um again each one was about an opportunity to work out work through a set of ideas I think or work with different people um 
the the other one that was significant for me was the one of the professional competitions for an installation, big installation competition, and um, a little bit different because it's not open to anyone. You have to get invited. Uh, but we had entered, and again, we felt like we had something strong. And as talking just about myself, right now being in an office setting at that time it was pretty new to me, working full time, and working with people who are not from my school. And right now I'm with all these other weird random people who are also a lot older. They have like kids, which is like a totally bizarre thing. You're like 22 or whatever. You just graduated. You're like talking to someone about concepts and they have like kids they have to take care of. You know, it's like, hey, man, I don't know anything about your life. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's talk about ideas and some shit. But you have a human being to take care of. It's weird. Um And then you have a boss, you know, they have come up from a certain background and you, you don't, you kind of wonder like, how much of my language and my way of thinking is going to overlap with theirs? Am I going to make any sense to them? So again, it's it's a process of a validation because if you can produce something great with them and and feel like you contributed because you've offered what you believe to be correct, right? And you're not just conforming. Uh, it's another level again of of building confidence or, or learning. And uh, we had won that competition again. Very fortunate and. And the office did everything correctly to to help to 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 uh, increase their chances of winning, and uh, an, another notch on the belt, sort of right. Another another thing that whatever else happens in my life, and this it might not sound kind of stupid, but whatever ever else happens and how shitty my designs are, I know at least I've done accomplished you know X, Y, and Z uh, whatever competitions. Like it's, I've been validated at least in that way. So you can die now as an yeah. architect. So you're good. Yeah, and I think that's you just the, need to build one house, and then that's it. You're done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's how the human mind works, right? Yeah. Um, so well, I think they're kind of like you know miles like like um, personal milestones. Mm -hmm. Like you see your professional path a certain length, and like those are little markers that somehow you keep like moving forward in the right directions. Yeah. Um, of course, there's the other reasons of building up your resume, curriculum vitae. But, yeah, but even beyond that, I feel like, um, you know, like you said, student competition, professional competition. And then, I mean, that also directly transcribes to like RFPs, mm. you know, like this is actually like the ultimate training to get to that level when you actually compete to get an actual project for your office for your business right um and i think having done some of those like more fun and, and personal and like small small um prices uh co you know competition are uh, an easy but maybe necessary training into getting prepared for those because mm -hmm. Those are much more intense and there is more at stake than there is by winning like 500 bucks for like a cool like patio design or whatever, right? Um, and, and, and those are actually pretty interesting because they're not the jury or the client isn't necessarily an architect, mm -hmm. which I feel like a lot of those design competition, you know, the background of the jury is within the realm of design or, arch or art or architecture, yeah. right? But when you deal with a developer who's the one running an RFP and ask six firms to compete for a project... Well, the rules are a little bit different and the way you're going to express things, like you're going to have to focus on, you know, different aspects. Yes. And um, that's for sure a scenario where, again, the thing you submit has to be polished. You can't have typos and weird things, no. right? Now. That's another, that's like the final level of uh, professionalism, I guess you would call it. I did an RFP with uh, one of my previous office in New York and... It was for this residential tower in, I think it was in like Greenwich Village or something. And my boss was like, oh yeah, like you want to participate to that? And we're like, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, everyone was like, why not? Why not? And, uh, and I was like, yeah, I mean, let's, you know, let's do it. Let's do it. And I think the project I was working on at the time wasn't necessarily like the most design exciting project. Uh, it was exciting on another scale of, of excitement, but definitely not on design. So I kind of saw the opportunity as like, okay, this could be really fun. You know, it could be like one way to like, just go like full force on like design and things. Um, and actually kind of ended up leading the effort of the RFP because no one in the office was really stepping forward. Mm -hmm. And it actually, it was very interesting <clears throat> because the everyone was involved in different ways. Uh, and they each felt, I think, that they had like 
that they were, they were participating to it. And we did, we did compete with other offices that were like way bigger than our office. Um, and you know, our proposal was our proposal. Maybe it wasn't the most like, you know, design like crazy one. Um, but I think it had some good legs and the way we presented it was pretty legit. And the client decided to go with the star architect. Um, but if the star architect wasn't there, they would have gone with us. Yeah, that's kind of bullshit. So, you know, there is like the homework you can do about the jury, but you don't really know who your competitors are to those competitions. So th there is only the rules you can control, and then there is the things you cannot control. Yeah, see, I'd be very hesitant to enter any kind of competition. I mean, RFPs are a different thing, but w w I'd be hesitant to enter something where they know the names of the people. Yeah. Um, because, I, I mean, you don't have the choice in many cases, but it's it, that's another... It's similar to like the winners decided in two weeks because of the concept. The winners decided by your name, in you know, to some degree, which is like totally, 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 totally unfair. Well, and if that's one of their requirements, so they know that they want somebody's name associated to the project, you know, it's almost like why are you asking small offices to even play in, in the big court when they don't have the right shoes for running? You know, like, it could be a political thing. So that was that was interesting, but I think it was a, a very good experience and. Um, you know, that reminded me, we, we talked about, about this on another episode when we were speaking with Greg Pascarelli of SHOP, but there was the competition for one of the big towers, uh, I think on Park Avenue or something like that in Manhattan, in New York City. And uh, for a while, the presentations done by the Star Architects were available on YouTube. So you really? saw, yeah, the whole thing, which I don't know... It always seemed to me like a fluke, like someone put it up there and they shouldn't have. <laughs> um, but Isn't it was that stuff got confidential. I don't. It was up there for a long time. I don't know if it's, if it's there anymore. But there was a presentation by Rem Coolhouse, um, Patrick Schumacher of Hadid's office, and Norman Foster, and I think Richard Rogers maybe was another or Renzo. I don't know. There's four or five, and I only watched through. I watched Rem Coolhouse, um, Patrick Schumacher, and. Um, Maybe it was Hadid herself, I don't remember. And Norman Foster. And the difference between and it's that's interesting to see because anytime we see these dark architects, right? These really well known established architects, they're in their arena. You know, they're giving a presentation, they've been asked to give a presentation, or they're pitching their idea. They're in control of it, you know, and they're coming from a position of authority, a position of power. That's very much the realm you exist within when you see any of their stuff. Um, in this case, though, they aren't. They're the ones hoping to win, and the people that are in control <clears throat> are the people sitting across from the table, which is the developer, and by extension, the audience, me, right? Uh, and you know, some 30-whatever-year-old, 20-year-old, 40-year-old person who's not at their level, let's say, and I'm watching them, and I'm acting as the jury because they're giving their pitch to, to the jury, and the power dynamic and the shift is like really, really weird. Graham Coolhouse's presentation and Zaha Hadid's presentation or Schumacher's totally different from Norman Foster's. <clears throat> um, Graham Coolhouse is at the table. He's hunched over. He's talking about the form of the building and the compressed, you know, tension, the, the compressed energy that it has because it's not too tall but not too short. It's just right. And, and it has this energy. And the energy he's talking about is completely a form. It has no actual energy. It's a former one because of the way it looks, right? And he talks about how it twists and sort of bends over this way or whatever. Very interesting, I think, from like an architect nerd like level. But for the developers, they're like, Conceptual. okay. Yeah, it looks cool, is what yeah, you're saying, yeah. basically, right? And he's doing his architect talk, and you just got the sense that if, it felt like he was a kid, kind of. And he was talking to adults, and the adults were like, all right, little what are kid, you saying? <laughs> but why don't we give a fuck about what you're talking about, you know? I you, feel like that's often how architects probably <clears throat> look to like the general public when yeah. they talk. It's like, what? What yeah. are those people saying? But why do I care, Yeah, right? Um, and Schumacher's presentation, Schumacher, right? Uh, also, um, he didn't seem quite child as childlike because he was standing up as opposed to leaning over on a table. Uh, but still, it's kind of like out of touch with the, the people he's presenting to because they're doing their architect talk. They're telling them why. Yeah, yeah. They're, uh, 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 cool House and Schumacher were telling them why Schumacher and Coolhouse are interested in their project. 
which doesn't make sense because you're not talking to like they should be talking to a mirror is what it looked like it looked like the space that they were talking to which was like a foot in front of them oh they're talking to the competitors but not to the actual jury <clears throat> norman foster's and so so their presentations were on slideshows right um, and I think Hadid's had like a stacked vase thing and there was vases for some, I don't know, whatever reason. No more in Foster's presentation. So polished, so fucking polished. He was wearing a suit. He had this big, fat, gorgeous tie on. I think it was pink. And he had physical, giant, beautifully printed boards that were on like foam core or gator board or something like I that. I know your audience. <laughs> and it was on, they were on easels. There was like three of them, a giant fat pen and a white uh, you know, paper board, drawing big sketches on, drawing on the, on the, I think he drew on the renderings, talking about the history of uh, New York and all these things. And it was so engaging. It's like, even if you, even if you listen to this thing on mute and you didn't know any of these people, you'd say, I vote for that guy. Yeah. And that was very fascinating. Very, very, I don't know if it's still online anymore. No, I might have to figure it out. It sounds pretty interesting. Um, the other thing I want to say with competitions is that we, so we had done a number uh, there was another one I did I forgot about, but but we had done a few while we were working at other offices as a way to get out the design, you know. Uh, we we'll get out of, uh, the the constraint of working for mm -hmm. like career projects that sometimes are not like the most design challenging mm -hmm. or exciting. Yeah, sure. Uh, or even you know on types of projects that you don't get to work on, you know, like we were working let's say on residential projects on a day to day, where that competition was born of an urban competition. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, I think it's a good way to make sure you balance out your interests if you don't necessarily get them out of your office yep. on a daily basis. You know, like just sprinkle the year with a couple couple competitions on like other scales or things that you're interested in. It doesn't even need to be architecture. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you mean it doesn't have to be architecture? As in I mean, urban? if you want to do, an, I don't know, an art competition right. or like a music <clears throat> competition or, like, you know, who knows, right? I don't know how many you would do like that uh, if you continue to lose, you know, uh, like how many you would do before you're like, ah, I guess it's kind of a waste of time, you know. I mean, that's not to say if you don't win that, that you are a loser because it's more like you just happen to be the winner than – then everyone else is a loser. You well, know? I think, I mean, there is, thing, like you said, there is things to gain beyond just winning the competition. There is things that you learn. There is things that you practice or get better at or even discover by yourself, about other people or about, you know, the project themselves. Mm. And also, like you mentioned, it's a way to build out your portfolio if you don't have certain things on it, you know, like... If you want, that's like really great and you can definitely go on about it during the interview process. But if you don't, well, you know, you have one or two listed. It just like adds up to your board and things you can talk about and your experiences, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Resume build. I think because everyone in them has their kind of perception of what who they are as a designer, right? And I think this is a good thing to do to keep yourself in check is to, in some ways, you know, look at your resume or portfolio and say, okay, I have this in, in my mind. I have my own view of myself. But is that reflected in what I've done? <clears throat> and a lot of people, especially once they start practicing, you know, years and years into practice, they look at what they've done and like, well, that's not me, right? I identify myself as a designer probably more based on what I did in school. But hey, that was 10 years ago, man. Like you've been designing shoe stores since then. <laughs> that's that's not who we are on paper. If we go by what the majority of the work you've done professionally, how much time you spent and how many projects you've done, it's, it's mostly you're the, you're the shoe store guy now. You're not whatever cool conceptual person you think. And I think because each project we do in school, is, each project we do that's our own defines a part of us. It's like yeah, a chapter yeah, yeah. in our lives and we build on it. It's a project. We know what it's like to feel that and have it be done and to ref hopefully reflect on it, think about it. And it exists as a book that you've like read and, it, and it's, it's archived in your mind. It's knowledge that, that you work off from. Um, and, but sometimes when you work in an office, you don't get the same sense of sense about each project right you don't feel like it's it's internal growth you don't feel attached to it necessarily you don't learn directly from it. you don't reflect about it a lot of times because it's again like you said conceptually not very interesting or whatever or there's a lot of problems they don't have to deal with you and you'd rather just not think about it go home and have a martini but the work that you do that's personal it stays with you so i think in terms of continuing continuing to grow too it's a good thing to go through because you're adding more 
more books to your collection or whatever, more significant personal projects that to actually define you as a designer. I think you're, you're right. It's a very good way to expand you know, yourself, your designer self uh, beyond just like professional practice. Mm -hmm. And it is yeah. tough. I mean, it is really tough if you decide to do one when you're working full time. And, you know, that's maybe why right now the quarantine is perfect because <laughs> you're cutting down your commute, you're cutting down your f schedule is flexible. So if you do want to do a competition, you know, you can manage it a little better. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's different, different times for sure. But if you're working full time and you decide to do a competition, no in advance. It's how difficult. much time do you have and how much time you can difficult. you know it's like at the end of the day it's almost like taking the air right like you really have to yeah. know what is the time commitment you're going to put into it are you serious about it or you know are you going to give up yeah and the people that you're working with how serious they are because you don't want to be misaligned yeah. when again you get into deep waters which is going to happen uh what, what how is that person going to interact in those situations i think also there's something about doing competitions and having things published. Like I talked about the the sense of uh, validation it gives once the the creator, but also it's the validation of the project itself that's important. And this is a much larger kind of perspective. So, like right now, when I give presentations to like students, and sometimes uh, I'm requested to show work, right? And I show a project. If I show a project that I did on my own. It didn't win anything, but I did, and I thought it was interesting. That has a certain amount of like gravitas and meaning. If I show a project and say, "Hey, this project won a bunch of awards, got published in in all these places," the students take that thing much more seriously, and the entire audience, everyone reading that blog or however they're they're consuming this information, take it much more seriously. And if you really truly believe that the the ideas from the project are worthwhile talking about. Maybe you believe that they're correct, but you at the very least believe that they are thought-provoking and people should be thinking about these issues because they relate to social, political things. Then it's, then I mean, then almost like you, you have to put it out there and you have to have people know and people have to know that it has already been validated. Because if you're fighting the good fight and we're talking about, let's say, urban issues that are for social justice and it won something... Like that has actual meaning beyond just yourself. Like you have to realize that it has meaning beyond yourself because now other people are going to take it more seriously. And given the chaos of the world now, that's a legitimate thing to consider. The downside with competitions, because there's a lot of discussion amongst the professional community. We're going to wrap it up soon. Amongst the professional community of, um, is this a good uh, you know, established process for firms to be winning projects. I don't think we're going to get into that right now. Um, generally speaking, no, it's a, there's problems with really it because you're doing a lot of free work, which requires labor up front for something you might not win. The reward you get is some measly amount and there's barely any recognition. And the recognition happens just within side of your circle jerk architecture community anyway. So there's a lot of problems with that. Well, but, so what is the value of the design that is proposed for those types of projects? Because of the short amount of interaction and time you have to produce something, like, you know, you could actually question the quality of it. That's true, too. Uh, so, so, okay, there's two things. And then that reminds me because I've worked at offices where offices will try and use competitions to get the design juices flowing. Because all, all the offices know, like, hey, doing bathroom remodels or doing a home for this shitty client is not fun. You know, we don't have a lot of money. So let's do a competition because I want that to be part of my office. Sounds cool. But again... It's 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 time and money. Who's going to pay for this extra time and money? So as employees, I would say that's a great thing potentially because you for all the reasons we talked about. But once you're professional and you're doing work that someone else's name is going to be on it, you have to recognize that your worth your work is worth a certain value. And are you getting paid to do that? So I've been in offices where they propose competitions, right? And people volunteer to be on it. I'm like, I'm not doing that. Are you kidding me? I'm underpaid as it is. For all of us are underpaid as it is. You want me to do more work outside of my more pay that I'm not going to be compensated for. And yes, I know that you're fair. You're going to give me credit and all my teammates credit. And we'll we're going to buy you pizza. And we're going to, if we win, our names will be out there in the world, which is, means something to me. And you will, as the boss, know it. And therefore, I'll have more value to you. But that's not enough. 
That's not enough in a professional setting where I'm an employee and you're an employer, right? I need to get paid for work I'm doing for you. That's just what yeah. it has to be. Um, so there's that thing to be aware of. The other for us, for me, I don't know about for you. <laughs> Speak for me now. <laughs> yeah. Um, was, no, no, I don't. Don't, don't, don't inject. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know you don't. <laughs> um, you don't speak French. No, can speak for me. <laughs> J'ai bleu à bleu. All right. Okay. J'ai bleuette. Um, Perdue. <laughs> After finishing the last one that we had done together and was outside of the office, I was sick of doing competitions. Is that and, the one I'm thinking of? Uh, probably. But uh, it didn't go well, but it wasn't because of that. It, the, the, the team process didn't go well. We got an honorable mention, so the project was good. We, we had gone some things, but there were other problems with it. But that wasn't why I got sick of competitions. I got sick of competitions. Actually, I was already tired of competitions before that one uh, because you, after doing six or whatever, you realize you're doing all this work. You're paying money to enter. You submit this thing, there's really not good chances you're going to win, regardless of how good your project is, because, you, again, it's just a crapshoot to some degree. Um, and even – and I don't get anything when I lose, but even when I do win, it's like this momentary um, celebration, and there's internal validation. But I've had that happen twice or three times. I don't need that anymore. What am I doing for now? Like the competition hosts, they give me some really small amount of money, sometimes nothing. They get to do press on it, right? And again, the press is always just within a very small community. I'm not going to get a project out of it, right? It's like, it's, it's, just, I'm not getting enough. What am I getting out of it? I'm putting all these ideas and these thoughts into this thing. It gets packaged up as this perfect whatever presentation PDF object goes out in the universe, makes a, a bloop in the water, not even a splash, you know, bloop. And there's some comments on it in whatever places and it gets published. Even it gets published in the New York Times or wherever else, right? It gets like a part of the MoMA. Oh, wow. Then it vanishes away and that's it. And so for me, the ideas that I was working through, it was helpful and good and whatever, but also like, that's not enough. Well, I mean, I think, I think there were, in, in your particular case, I think that there were a key step in your training and discovery of, of who you are as a designer and I kind of like directed your professional and, and life path a certain way after you won one. And I think it made a lot of sense that that ha they happened during school. <coughs> but like you said, and I think there was a lot of rewards for them to happen during school. But like, like, like you're mentioning, I'm not sure like what really the rewards are once you're out of school and you're like working and, you know, like living an adult life. Mm. What is the point of a competition? And, and what is that really, what is the return of investment on it, you know, for the time you're putting into? Because I think um, as a younger, when, when you are a younger designer and you're working out your own ideas, you are looking for that kind of validation, regardless of, of how uh, arrogant you are. Um but as you go along, you become more confident in things, right? You Because you've been exposed to more parts of the world and different people. And it's kind of like, I just got tired of putting in what I thought were pretty interesting ideas because they're based on a lot of different researches and whatnot. Um, and then waiting for someone else to just pass judgment. And it's not, and this sounds arrogant, maybe, but it's like the jury, it's like, show me your backgrounds. I don't. I don't, I don't know what kind of background you have. And if I do, and you have a bunch of degrees and you're have built this or that building, I don't know. Are you a good designer? Can you think critically? Are you fair in your judgment? Like if you're not aware, if you don't understand all the stuff that are, it's embedded in my project, I kind of feel like I'm being not, not punished, but like I'm sort of being punished because I'm not getting rewarded for it. And you're giving a reward to someone else. And like, like there's stuff conceptually. Right. And for me, it is about the idea. Yeah. Eh, it's like okay and at some point as you move through, through move through your career and you get older it's like okay but i'm no longer the student submitting i'm the teacher i'm the boss i don't care what the fuck you have to say mr whatever name who's not an architect who knows nothing about design and architect who's nothing knows nothing about actual urban issues and social issues and how they relate to public space and all of these things right got like consumptive spaces the disnification of spaces like you know this stuff you don't get it. And I've explained it to you and you're not seeing the value of it. 
So at some point, I feel like I, I hit that threshold. It was like, well, maybe my energies have to go somewhere else to put these ideas out there because I think they're valid and I think people should know about it. And maybe this competition is not the best way. Yeah. You know? I, and, and I mean, it, and I could see that, right? And when you're like an 18, 20 year old doing a competition and the jury is like people from like 35, 55, 60 years old who've like worked, practiced, done stuff like, you know, they can they can see a project a certain way and you can understand their feedback a certain way. Like there is a, a huge gap mm. of knowledge, experience and and all of that. But once you get older, you're getting closer to like this this jury, then you're more able to understand the dialogue or like, you know, there should be a different level of, of dialogue at that point. It cannot be that same uh, relationship. And it's interesting because as a, as a younger designer, through undergraduate school and masters, you're shooting upward in terms of how much you learn. And once you get into the professional world, a lot of people plateau in terms of this design thinking, design skills, because they work on crappy projects for 10 years or whatever, right? Everyone kind of goes different directions. It's just like, there's no longer, it's like everyone's a rocket going out of space and they get out of space and there's no more direction to anyone. People have kids, they have dogs, they move to wherever place and it's just, everyone's floating around and there's no sense of order which is fascinating to see it around our ages because at what point are former teachers, colleagues, I never think of them that way, but at what point are they colleagues and at what point do former students that I've had now, they're just as developed as me and whatnot. So that constant sense of progress is kind of like up for grabs after a certain point because it's on you. And when you're in that kind of floating mix, to have some dude over there tell me that what I'm doing is not as good as someone else's it's like well i don't think that's true there's no sense of order anymore and the only thing that really matters is not how many degrees you have what what grades you got and whatever it's 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 set by a larger audience which is the world and everyone outside of architecture so what i'm saying also is that that's also why the podcast was started for me is I got tired of putting out ideas that would have no longer life than a short thing and be consumed only by architecture community and be validated only by select few and read very superficially because it's a, it gets published, people read it real quick. I'd rather have a long, long format conversation for one and a half, two hours to talk about these serious issues that are in the projects. But if I can talk about it for this long and have someone listen, maybe that's um, just as impactful. Right. I think that's why I was never really into competition because I'm like, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really care who these people are, the right. jury. I mean, they could be like, you know, Norman Foster or whoever, like ah, who's Norman Foster outside of architecture? You know what sure. I mean? Like he's a big guy is, you know, he's done many things, but I don't really care what he thinks about what I have to say. <laughs> you know, mm. It's more like. I don't know what I think is is right and in a conversation more than like you are going to tell me whoever you are that my thing is good or bad because of what you think. Yeah, and and I, and I don't really find value in that. To be honest, I mm. find value like you say in like dialogue and debates and like like interaction that goes two ways than like judgment or like judgment selection right. or critics that only goes one way. Like to right. me, it's not. You it's going don't. one way and it's being filtered through a keyhole, yeah. right? Which is the competition format and you don't get to see how they read it or what to say or anything. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I totally get what you're saying. I think also it's not just a matter of the problem is that in a competition, you're basically uh, in a, you're competing in graphics. You're competing in a lot of senses, right? But you're also competing against ideas. And that's difficult because one idea is not more or less valid than another. It's just different. And that's and that's the thing that I think in general, competition of any kind, I have no interest in it because, because it's the idea that there is one that's best because there is the idea that there is a right and wrong and I don't necessarily believe that's the case. I believe that there is plurals and, and different ways of things hmm. and... I might find like, according to me, this is the best me and this is the right to me, but I don't think that I should apply my power over everything. I don't know. This sounds, Which did you, you smoke agree? something? Because this is not <laughs> your typical opinion or take on things. What do you mean? You, I don't believe what you're saying. 
I mean, I have extremely strong personal opinion, right. but I would never dictate to someone like this is what you should be doing. This is absolutely wrong. I'll tell you, according what I think, it's really wrong, and I don't care what you think or I don't care which way you want to go. Mm. But in my guts, I don't feel like that's right. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I uh, I'm not. I I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I I have my thoughts and ideas, and I and I. I not only think that they're right, but more importantly, I want them to be right, meaning that I try really hard to figure out if they're wrong or not. Because to me, everything is connected and that there there are, in fact, oh, let's get to the design. There are, in fact, ideas that are better than others, despite what I just said. And it's that's where this goes back to the idea that a strong, back to the, 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 the idea that a strong idea has tentacles and and in and somehow engages in a bunch of stuff. So, if we actually talk about design for a moment, like the design of a project could be based on like, oh, um, I looked at ice and you know ice melts and that's an interesting transformation and my project's form is somehow based on that. The shape of my project is based on that. Okay, well, that's a very thin, thin layer of idea, right? But if you're your, the meaning of the project, the idea for the project to exist or why it exists is based on there's a formal thing, there's a political thing, there's a social thing. It, it ties to community, it ties to the environment, it ties to the inhabitant, it ties to all these things. Well, that's a stronger idea, right? And which is why all architecture is eventually, it, it, to some degree, it's politics. So it's a it's a matter. So on, I'm saying two things. I'm saying on the one hand, I think there is a there is a final grand arena in scale which all things are tested. And in that arena, you consider every single philosophical whatever idea, poss- ways of viewing something. And they, you, you, you think about all that and how much the project addresses all of those things. At the same time, I think when you become established enough as a designer, uh, meaning established uh, yourself, I don't mean externally in terms of, in terms of publicity, you hopefully have a slightly new way of looking at things that no one else has. And so it becomes difficult to try and find validation within a system who doesn't understand what you're trying to do. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not talking about myself at this point, but I think abstractly it makes sense because their scale is different from your scale, right? And your job as an innovator is to say, actually, you know what? Your way of measuring is incorrect, there's this other way of measuring that's more profound and more whatever, whatever, whatever. That's what I measure myself against. You don't get that. That's why when I enter in my things, I never win. And at some point, that's not worth my time. So in the end, the real competition is not set by someone else. The real competition is whether or not you can have an impact in the world. That's the fucking competition, right? I think we should end it there. I don't yeah, that's good. <laughs> that was good. But, you are, know you, I mean? are you gonna are you gonna uh, go for president or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. No, yeah, that's. Uh... You've won the battle, but lost the war, sir. Um, I think that, that uh, is what yeah, yeah. at some point you I, go I, beyond. I mean, yeah, and I think I think that's what it is. The competition is just a, a jumping point to something that's greater than that. It's yeah. not. It's not the end. It's not yeah. the goal. Yeah. Um, and it's difficult to know when you should start to transition to kind of serve more your agenda and, and your mission becomes to more push your agenda rather than to try and satisfy others. Mm-hmm. Really difficult to know when that happens and, and, and how often and in what increments and how that gets interweaved into your life and process. I think you, you do it too soon, then you've stumped yourself, stunted yourself. I think maybe your personal level of, of happiness and satisfaction is an indicator of when you should be doing that. Uh, part two. <laughs> part two. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Because I think there's well, a lot of... Well, it depends how emotional you are. Yeah. There's a lot yeah, of... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Take it back. <laughs> I don't know you listeners. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We should end it, right? All right, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of The Midnight Charette. We say it every week, but we really do mean it show us your love by leaving a review on itunes i know a lot of you are in like spotify and you're thinking how do i 
support you guys. Well, go on Instagram, share <laughs> our, our podcast in your stories yeah. with your friends, send us an email with a review. We can publish it on our website. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also on iTunes, so you can, on uh, YouTube, yep. you can also leave us a, a message there or subscribe to our channel. Uh, we're close to a thousand subscribers, so it's pretty exciting. We're also on Facebook, and I believe there is a way on our page to recommend our podcast so take a look there we're not facebook experts so yep and we see all the likes and shares that you guys are are doing on facebook and all the different platforms that it means a lot to us it, it helps us know that we're doing something right and uh gives us a little bit of validation uh -huh. right, time back and to... we still have some beer glasses yeah, okay. uh, many of you <laughs> have been you know getting them we don't make money out of those to be honest we're just paying them off when you buy them uh, but it really it it gets That's us fun. very excited when we uh, when we ship a beer glass you know uh, let's see. We have the hotline, of course. Hit that up, 213-222-6950. Any questions, comments, suggestions? And uh, thanks again. I, we hope that all of you out there are staying safe and uh, staying motivated during these times. And we will talk to you again next week or sooner. Bye. Bye-bye.